Well, good evening. Tonight we are in chapter 3 of our study on the moral government of God. And last night we began looking at God's natural attributes, his, the nature of God. And we saw last night that God, the Bible reveals to us uh, through the scripture that that God is a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nature's N-A-T-U-R-E. N-A-T-U-R-E. U-R-E. So, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct personalities that comprise the Godhead, but yet a unity of purpose in uh a oneness in their being. Uh, tonight, we will see that uh, God is a spirit. So we look at this spirituality of God, that he is spiritual in essence, not having a physical experience. Up until, that is, when Jesus came into this world. But God manifests himself, or he is, a spiritual being. Uh, John 5, 37. <clears throat> and the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Seen his shape, or seen his form. And again, the reason for that is he's, he's a spirit. And this is a little bit hard for us to understand because we recognize personality as uh, being encased in a physical body. Uh, you know, a face, hands, shape. Uh, but God is spirit. And I think it helps us to understand when we recognize that the real personality, the real you, is also a spirit, and that we dwell in a physical body. Uh, but God is a personality uh, that is immaterial, uh, that does not dwell in a physical body until the point in time where Jesus Christ came to this earth, and then he introduced into heaven uh, something new, a new manifestation of the very essence of, of God, of the Godhead. And so God is spirit. Uh, John 4, 24. Uh, his essence, his personality, all, all of these natural attributes uh, are spiritual in nature. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. And so, when we continue to look at the nature of God, we'll see that God is omniscient, that he has all knowledge, that he's omnipotent, that he has all power. And we... Uh, understand power to be to be uh, associated with you know our physical bodies you know there's a strong man that person's weak uh, but God is a spirit and yet he's a spirit that can manifest unspeakable power uh, without there being you know a physical component to it he just speaks and there it is and so, God is spirit, we read. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, spirit and truth. So, from the depths of our heart, you know, we worship him. Now, Colossians 1.15. <clears throat> who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Yes, yeah, speaking of the Father, he is the... He, or that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. And so it refers to God as, 
you know, invisible because he is a spirit. Point number two, uh, the Godhead cannot be seen by our earthly consciousness. He may manifest, and he has to some of the Old Testament, New Testament uh, people, but he, we're talking about his essential essence. If he's a spirit, it, it's not seen with our physical eye. And we have this in John 1.18. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Yes, he has explained him, or declared him, or literally <clears throat> exegeted him, put the Godhead on exhibition. So that's why Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You know, he's the image of the invisible God. That he is, uh, you know, the very essence of God, the very spirit of God is not seen by our human consciousness. Uh, just as we don't see each other's spirit, mm -hmm. you know, and when our friend dies, the spirit will leave and we'll know when it's gone. But the real her is you know, spiritual in essence. And of course, we're made in the image and likeness of God. We have 1 John 4.12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Yeah, so again, another verse, no one has seen God at any time. There, there has been certain manifestations in the Old Testament. Uh, one in particular is, is, we see over and over again, is the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord does things that only God can do. And is assumed and thought that that was a, a Old Testament manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I believe when it says the angel of the Lord. Uh, so, so God appeared in that way. But we're, we're speaking of the very essence of who God is. It's immaterial. And we read two verses here that said no, no, nobody has seen it at any time. And because that is true about God, then no external images are to be made to represent the divine being. Because no matter what man would make, it would come short in truly representing what God is really like. Because, because what do you represent that, you know, what does the eternal spirit look like? Again, as is not to be seen with our human consciousness. So any statue, any, uh, you know, anything, no matter how well crafted by mankind, it would only diminish mm -hmm. man's concept of who God is. So for that reason, God gave us the, the, um, the commandment, thou shalt not make for them thyself any graven images, or fall down to worship them. Do you have that in Exodus 20, verse 4? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Yes. And again, the, the very good reason why he required that is it would only diminish and make smaller our concept of who God is. Because he, he inhabits eternity. Um, you know, he's, he's so much more than any, any statue, any golden calf, uh, any beautiful craftsmanship of mankind. And so he prohibits that. Do not. That's one of the Ten Commandments. That's one of the third, I believe. In the second, second, second commandment. 
Point number four, in the resurrection, the redeemed shall receive a spiritual body like unto his spiritual body. Philippians 3, 21. <clears throat> Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Referring to the, the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will transform our bodies into conformity with his body in glory. So again, we'll see in our lesson on time that there's been a change in the very manifestation of the Godhead, that now we have a glorified body. It looks like a human being, glorified body in heaven. And this glorified body has characteristics that are a little bit different than ours. It can appear in rooms, as Jesus did, um, but yet it's recognizable. He said, put your hands in my, the, the holes, put your hand on my side. You know, it's me, Thomas. Mm -hmm. and, and so this glorified body is back there in heaven uh, with the Father and the Holy, the Holy Spirit, of course, is sent down here to this earth. First uh, Corinthians fifteen fifty one through 53. <clears throat> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Yes. Yes. And of course, it will it'll, we'll be like the manifestation of God. We'll have a glorified body. Uh, like he has. And first John three verse two. Beloved, we are now children of God, and it has not appeared as yet that we shall be. We know that if he shall appear, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So we'll be like him in terms of, you know, the body that his spirit now inhabits in heaven. And so God is his spirit. Uh, point D, the Godhead live in an endless duration of time and have successions of thoughts, choices, and experiences. Uh, in, in their experience. So we call this eternity. That God is eternal. Those of us that have lived and grown up in the West have been greatly influenced by uh, the Greek philosophers of Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, you know, those guys two to three hundred years before Christ. Um, they were very deep thinkers. They developed um, logic and rhetoric and, um, you know, philosophy. They loved nothing more than sit around and, and philosophize. Of course, they had many gods. You had Atlas and you know, mm -hmm. uh, a whole a whole variety of, of gods that they served, uh, but they did think deeply about who God is, uh, using you know their logic that they'd come up with, and they came up with a definition of eternity as being the absence of time. Have you ever heard that definition before? That eternity is the absence of time. Hmm. Because in their mind, God is absolutely 
perfect in all of his ways. Um, he's at the, the apex. He's up here. Mm -hmm. And since you're at the top, the, the ideal of perfection, uh, any change whatsoever would be a change downward. You know, if, if you're an absolutely perfect being, so you, you're immutable, that means you, you cannot change at all. And um, they also had the concept that, that he was somehow over or outside of time and that, that he was a timeless being, and that's how they defined eternity. But when we come to the Bible, we'll, we'll see something different. We'll see a God that, um, that is reactive, a God who thinks along with mankind, a God who can be appealed to, a God who can change his mind uh, upon appeal. Uh, and, and so the Bible, like I say, is, is uh, really turns on its head the Greek philosophers and says, you know, they did not have the correct interpretation of God. They were, had a great human mind. They came up with great logic, uh, but they didn't have divine revelation. And we have divine revelation. And so the way the Bible would define eternity is not time without end. There's not the absence of time, but time without end. See, the Greeks said there's no time. The Bible says it's time without end, that there's always been time, that time is a part of who God is. Now, our modern philosophers have said that at the creation, uh, God created time and space, you know, in the material creation. And even the ev evolutionary scientists that, you know, don't believe in God uh, believe that, you know, time began... Uh, you know, at the Big Bang. That before that, there was no time. The time began at, at the Big Bang. I believe what the Bible will teach us, and we're going to look at quite a few verses, what the Bible is going to teach us is that time is part of the nature of God. He is eternal. He is eternal. To live in time, I mean, a living being requires time. A rational being, a being who thinks, a being who experiences, a being who makes decisions, uh, absolutely requires the element of time. When you take away time, uh, what you come up with is what... I've got here on my driver's license, my photo ID, you know, that, that's the absence of time. But that's not me. Because it might be a representation of me at a specific moment in time, but that is not me. Because this is outside of time, you know, it's just an instant in time captured on the film, but that can't picture cannot think, it cannot reason, it cannot experience, it, it's not living. God is a living being. He has always lived. He has always loved. He has always experienced. And all of those, all of those uh, aspects of life require time. And so I do not believe that God created time when he created the universe. I believe that time is part of the nature of God. It is who he is. God, in his essence, 
is eterni eternal. And eternal is time without end. So as we look in the past, there never was a time when God did not exist. He was not created. And there will never be a time in the future, this is this moment, in the future, where God will, will cease to exist. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So let's, let's look at some of the scriptures here to, to really verify uh, these things in our mind. Uh, point number one, the Godhead live in an endless duration of time. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and life lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. <clears throat> That's a very beautiful verse, that he dwells in a high and a holy place, uh, but he inhabits eternity. That's, that's his dwelling place. Uh, that's where he lives. He's, he's always been. He always will be. Uh, Revelation 1, verse 8. This verse tells us that God has a past, a present, and a future. I am the Alpha and the Omega, saith the Lord God, who is, that's present tense, who was, past tense, and who is to come, the Almighty. See, it's not all three at once. He's the God who was, the God who is, the God who is to come. And when he manifests himself to Moses at the burning bush, what, what was his name? When Moses asked God his name, what, what did Moses say? I am. I am. Isn't that not present tense? Yeah, he's always present tense. That's who God is. God is always present tense. <coughs> Revelation 1.8 says the God who was, God has a past. Everything from this point backwards in time is past to us. It's past to God. He has a perfect memory of everything that has taken place in the past, but he is the God of the now. He lives with us now. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And he will live with us uh, in the days to come, in the future. See, your presence with him in heaven is future to us and to him because it has not happened yet. Uh, Psalm 102, 24 through 27. I said, O my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. See, so years are ascribed to God. Thy years are throughout all generations. You know, and since he's a spirit, he's not affected by time. He doesn't get older and the hair get grayer like ours does every day. Because he's spirit. God is a spirit. He dwells in eternity, but, but he's present. 
He's I am with this now. So when it refers to God, it says thy years are throughout all generations. Um, the heavens are the work of thy hands. Even they will perish. You know, he created them at a certain point in time in the past. He says they're going to perish. But he's going to go on forever. Even they will perish, but thou will endure. All of them will wear out like a garment. Mm -hmm. You know, the physical creation wears out because it's subject to the second law of thermodynamics that says things go from order to disorder in the natural world. You don't believe me? Just look at your bedroom. <laughs> goes from order to disorder very quickly. <laughs> But, but that's, that's the second law of thermodynamics. And, um, but God, uh, he, 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 he's immutable in that sense. He, he's not, he changes not. He doesn't grow old and feeble like we do. He says, like clothing, you know, the entire physical universe, uh, thou wilt change them and they shall be changed, but thou art the same. In his moral character, in his natural attributes, he's the same. And thy years will not come to an end. And so the Bible ascribes years to God or time to God. Now, when the creation happened, you know, he put into position the means by which we measure time. We measure time uh, by the rotation of the earth. When it rotates once, we call that 24 hours. We call it a day. Uh, when it rotates one time around the sun, we say, well, that's a year. You know, so the way we measure time is from the creation. But time itself, what is time? You know, it is one moment after another. It's, it's the idea of succession, of one thing following after another. Because you're talking about a God who is a living being. And it, if you take time away, you take life away. You have just that photograph that I showed you on my ID. But we have a living God. Yes, his dwelling place, he inhabits eternity. But he's the God of the now. He's the I am. Point two, the Godhead are engaged in the process of reasoning. And this takes time. Because when we think, uh, we think proposition <clears throat> A, proposition B, and then we come up with a conclusion that we didn't have at the beginning of the process. And so all of our logical reasoning requires the element of time. Because it's you, you go through a logical progression when you think. And then you come up with a conclusion. You know, you gather the information and come up with a conclusion. And even our computers fast as they are, they're lightning speed, but they but they go through a process, you know, to, to come up with, you know, the conclusion. And so it requires the element of time. Yes, it can happen in microseconds, <laughs> but it goes through a sequence, you know, a program. And so our th logical thinking, our minds, um, you can't think without time. Without time, there's not life. And that's why in the 60s, uh, Time Magazine ran an article. I was a little boy, walked out to the road, picked up the mail. There's Time Magazine that my folks subscribed to. Right on the cover, it said, God is dead. I thought, well, how can this be? I just <laughs> talked with them. <laughs> oh. But it was shocking. But see, that was their, the philosophy of the time that if you take God outside of time, there is no God. You know, God is dead. 
uh, it was it was just the result of, of human reasoning. Uh, um, but it but it's illogical. Of course, God is not dead. <laughs> He's very much alive, and so He reasons. Did we read Isaiah one eighteen? Yeah. No. Come. Okay. That's it. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Yeah, so here God is reasoning with man. Um, he says, come now, let us reason together. And then God puts forth the proposition. You know, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson... They can be as white as wool. And then he says, if you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. What's it going to be? <laughs> you know, so he, he's reasoning with man. That takes time. If, if God were somehow outside of time, you couldn't have that kind of interaction. Uh, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. <clears throat> For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you and unex to give you an expected end. And so that reveals to us that God has thoughts. <clears throat> He's thinking about us. And um, again, that, that requires one thing after another, the idea of succession in God's ex existence. Uh, point number three, uh, God experiences emotional reactions of pleasure or grief. And again, these emotional reactions are dependent upon his observation. It depends upon his experience. What are you experiencing now? See, Lisa's going to experience some grief, you know, when the time comes. You know, and God experiences emotion when the time comes because emotions are reactions mm -hmm. to what your mind is occupied with mm -hmm. so we have Zephaniah 317 uh, this passage would show a very positive emotion in God a little Book of Zephaniah. Uh, three seven? Uh, three seventeen. Okay. Have it. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. You know, when your heart is right with God, it, it brings him pleasure. He will joy over you with singing. He will exult. He will exult over you. He will rest in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. With shouts of joy. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> But he doesn't do that over disobedient children. But when he does see obedience, you know, this is his response. Mm -hmm. See, so the way emotions work, uh, they're reactions to what's, what's taking place in your personality. And so God, experiencing the full range of emotions that we do, after all, we're made in his image, and of course, he, his emotions are 
you know, multiplied times greater than ours. We're just tiny, finite miniature. And so his emotional reactions would, you know, would, would be as great as he is. And the, in Genesis uh, 6, 5, and 6, or do you have the Luke? Okay, I, have Luke I have Luke 7 and 10. Here's the 15, joy. Yeah. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse 10, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Okay, we're talking about time and as it relates to God, when would that joy be experienced in heaven? Upon repentance. At the time of the repentance. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's the only way we can read it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't experienced before the foundation of the world. It was experienced at the moment that individual repented and there was great joy in the presence of God and his holy angels uh, when... When one sinner repents, great joy. I've got the Genesis 6, 5, and 6. Okay. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So verse 5 says, The Lord saw. Again, we could ask the same question. When did he see it? Did he see it before the creation? Because at the creation, he said, he looked at it, everything he made and said, behold, it's very good. Now he's looking down. The Lord saw the wickedness. He saw the intention of the hearts was evil continually. And the Lord repented that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. See, why would there be repentance if this were always in his experience. Why would there be repentance now? Why would there be sorrow now? He said that he was sorry that he had made man, he was grieved in his heart. See, grief is an emotion we experience when we suffer great loss. <clears throat> and that's, that's the emotion God was feeling. You know, because he had suffered a great loss. He didn't create these people to live in rebellion against him. That was not his desire. That was not his plan. You know, and it, it just absolutely broke his heart. And I think the, this is just my own imagination, but I think the flood was a, a manifestation of his grief. You know, his tears, and just the sorrow. And he said, I'll, I'll destroy man off the face of the earth, for I'm sorry that I made them. So at this point in time, when he made man, it's very good. Mm -hmm. Now at this point in time, he looks down, he sees the rebellion, he said, I'm sorry I made them. Mm -hmm. So we're speaking of an eternal God who is the Alpha and the Omega, but he's the God who is, the God who was, and the God who is to come. But he's living with us in, in, this, in this duration. Hallelujah. He's the God of the now. Uh, Psalm 95, 9 through 11. <clears throat> when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest." And so here again we see the, the grief of Almighty God. 
I swore my anger. You know, so how does anger come? It comes when you're provoked. <laughs> you know, when you see something that provokes you. And he said, I, therefore I swore my anger. They're, they will not enter my rest. For 40 years I loathed that generation. You know, they, your fathers tested me. They tried me. God was very tried. His patients were tried. Forty years, I loathe that generation. You do not know my ways, therefore I swore in my anger, you shall not enter my rest. So again, anger is a manifestation that we all feel when we're unjustly provoked. And they provoked him. Look what he did for them. You know, provided all of their needs, saved them from the tyranny of Pharaoh, mm -hmm. brought them to a promised land. And they said, well, this golden calf, he's the one that delivered you. And it, it just pierced the heart of God. And, and again, what, what we're trying to say when we show these various emotions of God is that our emotions our reaction to what we're currently going through. Mm -hmm. Their reactions, they're involuntary. They, they just come. Mm -hmm. They follow what, what our mind is occupied with. Mm -hmm. And when he saw the rebellion, it just, it just provoked within him that, you know, that displeasure, that anger. And he said, you're not going to enter into my rest. Yet that was his plan back here. Mm -hmm. But when they rebelled, they said, no, you're not going to enter my rest. Even though I've saved you, I've delivered you, I've brought you, I've released you from Pharaoh's bondage, you're not going to enter my rest. Uh, because he's interacting with them. You know, in a just God, he's dealing with them as they deserve to be dealt with. He wanted them to love him. He wanted them to follow him. He gave him it, the law, which was for their good always. And they said, oh, we'll obey it. And God said, oh, I, I wish you would. It would be well with you. Hallelujah. And so again, ex emotional reactions require that there be time. Point four, the Godhead perform actions at definite periods of time. Ezekiel 32.17 <clears throat> In other words, God can have new thoughts, make new decisions uh, based on uh, his reaction to what is taking place. Ezekiel 32.17 It came to pass also in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Shall we read more? Uh, no, but what, what it's saying there, it gives a very specific timeline. Mm -hmm. You know, at a certain day, a certain month, you know, God makes a decision. He, he acts at a certain point in time. Uh, Deuteronomy 2.25 This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens. When they hear the report of you shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. So this is a, an example of providential government. As the children of Israel going forth out of slavery, they were not trained military people. Can you turn that out for us? Yeah, they were not trained in any way. Uh, you know, the other enemies would, a 
of course, not appreciate them tromping through their territory, you know, any more than we should not appreciate three million people coming across our southern border. You know, you'd think, you know, the nation would say, what's going on here? And especially back in those days. And here, the children of Israel were crossing through nations that were occupied by other people. And their natural reaction would be, no, you know, you're not coming through our land. But God said, this day, you know, right this moment, I'm going to put the fear of God in those people so they're not going to attack you. And again, showing God doing something at, you know, a specific moment in time. You know, he didn't do it back here. You know, he, there was a specific this day uh, when that occurred. And that was probably lifted later on when he saw fit, you know, when they entered the promised land. But while they were going there, um, he made a decision to do something in, in, uh, in time. And you can't jump in and out of time. You know, if God were an eternal now, where would he have time to make a decision to enter into time? Because to make a decision requires time to make that decision. I have an illustration that I read years ago in a book by Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth. No, I think it was, uh, maybe it's the one about Satan and Satan is alive and alive. Satan is alive and alive. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he his, his philosophy was that God dwells outside of time and that you know, that he is an eternal now. And so this is how he diagrammed it. And this is how a lot of people think of God's eternity uh, compared with time. So a few days ago, we had the Rose Bowl Parade, right? California? Mm -hmm. you, have you guys ever watched it? <clears throat> yes. Okay. <clears throat> so you, you've got the street with all of the floats coming down the streets. So it's a little easier to draw. And so we're in the grandstand right here, watching the float. And, and so the, the concept that many people have is that, you know, man's relationship to time is, you know, we're at the, the Rose Bowl Parade. We're sitting up here in the grandstand, and we see one float at a time, you know, as it comes mm -hmm. in front of us. But up here we've got the Goodyear blimp, and it's got a little observation tower there. And so the people up here in the cameras, uh, they can see the end of the parade from the beginning, the beginning from the end. And so this is represented that this is how God is, that mankind is, is down here in time. We just experience one day at a time, like the floats go by the grandstand, one float at a time. But God is outside of time. He is in the Goodyear blimp here, and he sees the end from the beginning. That sounds logical, doesn't it? <laughs> but the problem with this illustration is, um, we are, this illustration deals with space not time. You know, it's the Goodyear, people in the Goodyear blimp simply have a, a bigger perspective. But yet they're, they're watching the same parade uh, as we are down here. They're just seeing it from a different perspective. But it's still uh, one float at a time. And, and so, like I said, 
that illustration where it, where it fails is, is that it deals with perspective and it deals with space, but it doesn't deal with moment by moment. Because uh, the reality is God is with us moment by moment. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. he, can, he can see <coughs> the past. It's in his memory. But the future hasn't happened yet. He's the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. Now, he may have plans for the future, just like you have plans for you, your future. But again, that hasn't happened yet, because God is the God of the now. Jesus is, I am. I am. Any thoughts on that? See, see it's, it's space, not time. It's just a different perspective, but yet it's, it's the same parade. You know, when the parade ends, it's going to end up here, it's going to end down down here, you know, in five o'clock or whenever the Rose Bowl parade ends, it ends, you know, and it ends up there, it ends for us down here. And and they experience it just in a different way, uh, but it's still duration, one thing after another. And, and so that illustration that they use to try to um, define the existence of God it doesn't line up with scripture because scripture shows us a God who was, a God who is, a God who is to come. Thy years will not come to an end. You know, a thousand years in thy sight is like yesterday when it passes by because God is his spirit. He's not going to get any older. Just, and you know that by your own spirit, because on the inside you feel like you're timeless. The real you, from as far back as you can remember, you know, and you thought your thoughts, and you heard your own voice speaking in your mind, that's the same tonight as it was when you're five years old. And we're eternal spirits. And so is God. But yet the Bible ascribes uh, the passage of time or time to his experience. Thy years will not come to an end. You know, a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday as it passes by. It's not going to affect him in the same way. Uh, but it's still there. And again, the thought that thinking deciding and experiencing all require time. And we have uh, verse after verse in the Bible of God observing and making decisions based on man's decisions. Uh, Deuteronomy 2.25 <clears throat> This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. Okay, we've read that one. <clears throat> so it's a specific point in time, this day. So God performs definite actions and definite periods of time. Acts 17.31 Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him 
from the dead. Yeah, so he's fixed today. <clears throat> As we've read the Gospels. Uh, Jesus said that that day of judgment, the day of his return, he said only the Father knows. Giving the impression that perhaps that decision had not yet been made. You know, he's going to see how things turn out. <clears throat> and then at a point in time, he'll say, that's enough. I'm coming back. Hebrews 4, verse 4. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Our point number five is God cares for those in submission to him. He observes, uh, he reacts, he hears our prayers, uh, he intervenes on our behalf. Uh, Deuteronomy 23, 14. <clears throat> Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver and defeat your enemies before you, Therefore, your camp must be holy, and he must not see anything indecent among you, lest he turn away from you. So it describes God as overshadowing their camp. And he says, you know, make sure your latrines are in order. Make sure there's nothing indecent in there that he must not see anything indecent among you unless he turn away from you. And so God's constant oversight. And so it's not oversight in billions of years past uh, where, where the future is absolutely fixed like a DVD that's already been produced. And God's watching the reruns a million times. That would be pretty boring, don't yeah. you think? Yes. If there was a DVD yeah. of uh, everything from the creation to the judgment, that this DVD has already been completed, and the God's just up there on the celestial couch just watching the reruns and billions of times. No, <laughs> the Bible shows the God who is, who is engaged with us moment by moment. Touch with the weaknesses of our infirmities. Uh, we can bring joy to his heart. Or we can cause him pain. Second uh, Chronicles 16, 9. <clears throat> For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Yes. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. <clears throat> so, for, so the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. Isn't that beautiful? Mm-hmm. You know, he's constantly, see, he, he's engaged. That's what we're trying to say. So if you, you, if you believe in the eternal now, uh, you, you take away that engagement. You know, but he's with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us, present tense, I am. Praise his name. Uh, point six, uh, the Godhead make decision in response to man's condition rebellion, or change of attitude. And we have some examples of, zit, of this. Exodus 32, 7-14, the beautiful intercession of Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, 
Get thee down, for thy people which thou brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed there unto, and said, <clears throat> These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked stiff people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why didst thou wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. This is a very powerful passage of scripture. <clears throat> um, it, Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. The children of Israel are down. They've made themselves the molten image. They're worshiping it. And, and God observes what has taken place. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. And again, when did you see them? Did you see them two weeks before it happened? Did you see it a month before it happened? Did you see it a million years before it happened? He saw it when it happened. Otherwise, he wouldn't have reacted like he did. See, if he would have, you know, gone through the DVD a millions of times and here, you know, the plot perfectly and there it is and now it comes around. Uh, do you think you're going to be jumping up and down? And, you know, it... it <laughs> <laughs> but but he sees it he said he, I've seen this people and and he reacts you know because he's a holy God he can't imagine what are these people doing I brought them out I delivered them I saved them I want them to be my people and they're worshiping this golden calf and saying this is what brought you out of Egypt and he was Roth, he was mad. He was mad. And he says, step back, Moses. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to make a, a new nation of you. You know, and anybody less humble than Moses would have said, I think that's a good idea. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Now you got something you can work with. <laughs> but see, this is to me where he is one of the meekest men in the earth. And he intercedes. Mm -hmm. And he reasons with God. He reasons with God. God says, now Moses, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them. I'll make a great nation of you. Moses entreated the Lord. You know, what are the Egyptians going to say? Mm -hmm. What about your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Mm -hmm. You know, and he reasons with God. Remember, Remember your promises. Remember your covenant. Then verse 14 is so precious to my heart. So the Lord changed his mind. King James says the Lord repented about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Hallelujah. And so what does this show us? It shows that prayer can change things. If the future were fixed, Nothing could change. Nothing could change. But but it's not. Because he is the I am that dwells with us. And we see that prayer touches his heart and can change the situation. Uh, Deuteronomy 9, 18 and 19.
And I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you have committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was wrathful against you in order to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. So another answer, answer to prayer where this man stood in the gap and interceded and saved the nation. Praise the Lord. That's encouraging, isn't it? Where God can make a declaration and then even change his mind about it. Because he said, step back, Moses. I'm going to destroy them, make a new nation of you. See, that was a declaration right straight from the mouth of God. But he changed his mind, you know, based on based on the humble intercession of Moses in reasoning with God. See, he gave God good, sufficient reasons why he should change his mind. You made a covenant. What are the Egyptians going to say? You know, he, he, he reasoned it through with them. Praise the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, 10, 11. <clears throat> then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repents me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. So this is God speaking. And then God says in verse 11, um, I regret, or I repent, that I have made Saul king. Mm -hmm. who, who chose Saul to be king? The people. No, it was God. <laughs> God chose him. He sent Samuel to anoint him. The people asked for a As king. As a concession. Yeah. Yeah. The people asked for a king, yeah. like you said. Okay. But it was God who chose him and sent Samuel to anoint him. But now, he, and he started good. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he prophesied. and mm -hmm. You know, he was a good man until... David came along and, you know, he heard the women singing while well, David's killed his thousands. You know, Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. And I think from that moment onward. Jealousy. Yeah. yeah. And, and it came to the point where God Almighty himself says, I've made a decision that I've come to regret. Isn't that amazing? Yes. 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 I, am I reading anything in here? You know, this is what the Bible says. And so when he, when he turned his heart uh, toward the Lord, then God himself said, I, I regret or I repent that I've made him king. Because he has turned, because he has turned back from following me. That was not God's will. That was not his plan. That was not predestinated that that should happen. But he turned back from following me. Very sad. But again, what does it show us in regards to God's dealing with man and time? And we are asserting the fact that God is eternal. That that's the nature of God. He's eternal. But we're trying to understand what eternity is. And I believe the Bible would teach us that eternity is time without end. Mm -hmm. That time is part of the very nature of God. Mm -hmm. That if there's no time, there's no life. Mm -hmm. 
you take away time and you end up with a photograph. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Oh, Lord. Uh, while we're in Samuel, uh, verses 23 and 25. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. 25. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel, but Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Mm -hmm. Tragic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There is repentance, but it's too late. So please pardon my sin. Return with me. He said, no, I'm sorry, the Lord has rejected you. You know, you've gone too far. Uh, Jonah 3, verse 10. We know the story of Jonah, how he went to Nineveh to <clears throat> give them the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was that yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. But when they heard it, uh, they repented. The king issued a proclamation. And the, uh, the mind of the king was this. He said, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we do not perish. Then verse 10, when God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concern, concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Amen. Amen. So again, the proclamation was, Forty days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. But remarkably, the people repented. And then when God saw the thoroughness of the repentance, you know, he had a change of mind. He said, I, I, you know, I'm not going to judge this nation. So he's not even, I don't know how to phrase this, he's... It, it doesn't, it doesn't bother him to almost appear inconsistent. You know, he gave his word, 40 days Nineveh, Nineveh shall be destroyed. Is the fact that mercy triumphs over judgment every time. You know, so, so he's, if I could, I, I don't know how to say it lightly. Um, you know, he gave his word. Forty days in Nineveh shall be destroyed. But a greater good was these people repented, you know, and the mercy triumphed. And, and the Lord didn't mind if he would look inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And that was Jonah's problem. Jonah, in, in verse 4, said, <laughs> yeah. uh, Was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Uh, therefore, to foresaw this, I fled to far... Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents of com calamity. <laughs> said, I knew that about you. That's why I didn't want to go. <laughs> so God wasn't worried about looking inconsistent, <laughs> but the prophet certainly was, you know, because he felt he looked bad. <laughs> so 40 days in the should be destroyed and it didn't happen. <laughs> but again, I think it's very instructive. 
when God yeah. saw. Yeah. You know, so he made the declaration on the timeline. At this mm -hmm. point, he said, 40 days Nineveh shall be destroyed. And we have to assume that the God of truth, you know, the Almighty God, that what he says is absolute truth, that that was in the heart of God. In a 40 day time period, they would be destroyed. Uh, 40 days later. Uh, but they repented. And then God, when God saw it, he said, when God saw that they had repented, he saw it right here. He did not mm -hmm. see it here. Mm -hmm. He saw it here. Then he relented. Yeah. Hallelujah. Off. He was all ticked off. <laughs> you know, because it made him look inconsistent. <laughs> it really bothered him. But it didn't bother God. You know, God said, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, let's move on here. Point number seven. Uh, the incarnation of Jesus brought changes to the Godhead. The Greeks' idea of timelessness, uh, th there can be no change. But yet, with God, there was a change in his very... Um, appearance in heaven. He became a man, took on the form of human flesh, born of the Virgin Mary, walked this earth, died on the cross, was resurrected, received a resurrected body, and took that body back into heaven with him. And so this brought about changes in the very, in the very Godhead that require God living in a chronology of events. First uh, John 1, 1 and 2, and then 14. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So that was obviously the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, before he had a physical body. Uh, he was a spirit with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 14, And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as the, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so a change took place. Uh, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then Hebrews 1, verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. I have begotten thee. That's, I brought him forth. So he brought him forth into the world, and he brought him forth out of the grave. Now the Holy Spirit began his earthly activity at a certain point in time. Uh, John 7.39, Jesus prophesies about his coming. <clears throat> but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. 
So he's speaking on this side of the cross. He said the spirit was not yet given, but he went to the cross. He died. He rose again. He was glorified before the throne of God. And the Holy Spirit was poured out. And so he speaks of it here in, in the future. You know, that it would not happen until he was glorified. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were, future, were to receive. But the Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And when he was glorified, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts 2.33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. So the Holy Spirit began at a certain point in time. Point nine. Uh, God has made decisions concerning distant plans which he expects to bring about in the process of time, representing them as future. First uh, Samuel two thirty five. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. It's the prophecy of Jesus. Raise up a faithful priest, and I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before mine anointed forever. Always. Prophecy of Christ. So again, it's God revealing a future plan. Uh, Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass, when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. Yeah, so God is speaking of a certain timeline, and, and at this point in time, he, he tells of a future plan that they're going to be captured by the Babylonians. They will serve them for a 70-year period, and then, then he will set them free. And so he announces future plans, you know, something in his heart. And some would say, well, he... You know, he sees the end from the beginning. It's, it's always been there. But what we're seeing here is the announcement of what he plans to do uh, in the days ahead. And he's very specific. You make plans for the future. You know, and they can be quite detailed. You can change your mind about certain things, but, but we do that. We're made in his image. And God makes plans and announces them ahead of time. And he said in the fullness of time. That's key. All right. Now Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, yeah. and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. So again, the announcement of, of the coming of Christ. Uh, let's go to the New Testament, Luke 23, 28 through 31. But Jesus 
turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Follow on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Mm. So Jesus is prophesying about the um, destruction of Jerusalem, uh, which would be future, you know, 40 years after his death in 70 AD. Hallelujah. Uh, to, sum, to sum this up, um, just like you don't have a, you can't operate a train without a track, you know, human beings, moral beings, including God, require time in their experience. God is eternal, but again, it's how do we define eternity? The Greek said well, there, there is no time, that God somehow lives outside of time. Uh, but as we read these many verses in the Bible, uh, it shows us that something different that he can be reasoned with, that he can change his mind based on his observations, based on prayer that comes up before him. And I love that about God. To me, it makes the relationship so much more precious, so much more uh, intimate than it would be if uh, before all of creation, God had in his mind everything that would ever take place uh, throughout all of eternity, uh, that he's outside of time and, and that's all in his mind. If that's the way it is, then nothing could ever change. That man would be a subject of fate. That what was going to happen is going to happen regardless. And, and let me illustrate that in just, just one more way. I'll use the same illustration when you talk about God's knowledge. But, but think of it this way. Uh, here we are. What's the day? The 4th of January? Okay, January 4th, 2023. And uh, we all made a choice. Uh, we made a choice to come to the Bible school today. And we acknowledge the fact that we have a free will and we could have chosen to stay home or go to some other event or you know, watch TV or whatever it might be. But the simplest of all choices <clears throat> is between two alternatives. And we're free will agents and all of us here tonight made the decision that on this particular point in time, January 4th, 2003, uh, I made the choice to come to Bible school. Now, let's say God lives outside of time, and before the, the foundation of the world, God has a telescope that he can somehow look down through time, and he sees uh, all of us sitting here tonight at the Bible school, if he sees that in his mind, would we have had the freedom to stay home? Could have we stayed home? If he saw it as a fact in his mind, <laughs> would we be free to stay home? What was your mind? <clears throat> Absolutely. See, if he saw that as a certainty, if he looked down through his telescope, right. now telescopes cover distance, they don't cover time. Mm -hmm. But somehow, you know, this idea of, of the eternal now God living outside of time, if he saw that at this particular moment in time we're at the Bible study, you're going to be at the Bible study, mm -hmm. and you do not have freedom. 
that freedom is just an illusion. If he sees it with absolute certainty, then moral freedom is simply an illusion. How can he love him? He'd be... But the reality I... is, the reality is he's the I am. Mm -hmm. He lives with us. Uh, he's the... He, he lives in time without end. There never was a time when he didn't exist. There never will be a time in the future when he ceases to exist. And he reveals himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the God who was, who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. So, Father, we thank you for this revelation of who you are. And, Father, I thank you that you are this kind of a God, that you're not the God of the, the imagination of the Greeks, Lord, which, which leaves such coldness, which leaves us in isolation. But Father, you are a God of the now. And Father, we're so thankful for the revelation that you hear the prayers of your people. We thank you that you're touched with the weaknesses of our infirmities. We thank you that when one sinner repents, all heaven uh, breaks out into joy when they experience the repentance of that sinner. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that the, uh, your eyes move to and fro to, to show yourself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards you. Father, I thank you that this is the revelation of your Bible. And Lord, I, I just... Pray, Lord, that you would seal these truths to our hearts. Father, that, that we would understand, Lord, that, that we can have a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We should teach.